I'd like to welcome everyone um, to our webinar on private land conservation in New South Wales. My name is Jamila Hallinan. I'm the Head of Legal Education at the Environmental Defenders Office and co-hosting with me tonight is Elise Broadwood Mills, who's our Education Solicitor. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land in Sydney and I pay my respects to Elders past and present of the Gadigal people and I'd extend those respects to the Elders um, of the lands that you're all coming from tonight. So the purpose of this webinar is to introduce you to the wonderful world of private land conservation. New South Wales landholders have a number of options to choose from if they're interested in conserving their land and who better to tell you about those options than the providers themselves. So we're lucky enough to be joined tonight by Kate Smiley and Toby Edmonds from the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, John Asquith from Community Environment Network, and from, by Helen Church from Humane Society International. I wanna thank our panelists for giving up their time this evening. This webinar is part of our um, Defending the Unburnt collaboration with WWF, and we've got Stuart Blanche from WWF here as well. And he's gonna tell us more about why it's so important that we do everything we can to defend unburnt landscapes. I should note up front that some of the options that we'll discuss tonight may not be available in all areas that were impacted by the bushfires, but they all are capable of contributing meaningfully to the conservation of land and to biodiversity in New South Wales. Elise, do you wanna move us into the presentation? So another thing to note before we start is that the content we're providing tonight is legal information and not legal advice. Um, if you do think you need legal advice, you can call the Environmental Defenders Office or um, request advice through our website. Okay. First up tonight, we're gonna to have Stu tell us why WWF and EDO are working together to defend unburnt areas. Then I'm going to briefly outline what private conservation is, and then we'll look at the various options that are available to New South Wales landholders. There's going to be an opportunity um, at the end of this webinar to ask questions of our panelists. You can do this by putting your question into the chat function um, or the Q&A function, you choose. Um, and Elise and I will read those out um, to our panelists at the end. So you can put your question in at any time that we'll ask them towards the end. So over to you, Stu. Great, thank you, Jamila. And um, uh, it's great to partner um, on behalf of WWF and our supporters with EDO and the Defending the Unburnt program. My apologies, I'm perched in an airport. Um, of course of a late flight, so I'm sandwiched between events. So apologies for that. I'm very excited about this work because private land conservation is so important for a number of reasons. Most biodiversity and carbon stores and production of ecosystem services like water is on private land. And so uh, the environment groups, um, government investors, supply chains uh, uh, need to work with private landowners to secure important habitats, particularly after the fires. Uh, if you went through them in 2019-20, uh, you'll know that uh, they were catastrophic and a lot of our forested ecosystems were burnt. Not all. And thankfully, we have such good mapping these days, we can identify where the refuges are that did not burn or burnt at... Uh, sorry, we just had another just had another blackout at Melbourne Airport. So I'll keep talking and hopefully, Jamal, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, okay. Um, so I want to talk a bit about how WF approached the Defending the Unburnt um, partnership with EDO. We did a, a significant spatial analysis looking at various criteria for important ecosystems, predominantly forested areas from southeast Queensland to East Gippsland that did not burn or did not burn it at catastrophic or, or moderate or even high intensity. We came up with six landscapes. Um, I note that the New South Wales government and uh, academics and the federal government, have, we've all come up with our own spatial analysis. I think ours fairly well um, mirrors those of other organisations. And this, um, 
our six landscapes are the border ranges on the uh, Queensland New South Wales border, the Nimboida, the north coast of New South Wales, Yengo Wallamai around Greater Sydney, particularly the north, the south coast of New South Wales, and Gippsland Eden on the border between New South Wales and Victoria. And um, our marketing engagement team, bless them, came up with sort of example iconic species, which WF focuses on to represent to people uh, why these ecosystems are very important to um, conserve. So, for example, in the border ranges, we identified superb Albert lyre birds is critical to hanging on to those ecosystems and BirdLife Australia has done a lot of work to identify what the fire impacts were and have been on lyre birds, for example. Then the Moira, Platypus, the North Coast, we, um, we focused on great koala, um, koalas, partly because there's such a large uh, number of koala hubs and arcs identified by the New South Wales government and, uh, and other ecologists. And it's also the focus of a lot of the work of, for example, the Great Koala National Park folks and a lot of the great work from New South Wales government agencies. Around Greater Sydney, there are many species, of course, we could have identified for these six landscapes. We focused on grey-headed flying fox, very important um, uh, species in our uh, in ecosystems that rely on uh, particularly uh, rainforest species and uh, winter flowering gums for pollination and seed dispersal very critical. Um, on the south coast, we looked at spotted tail quoll, uh, one of the key apex predators um, that uh, we are uh, very keen and working on with many partners. And we're looking at rewilding spotted tail quoll and eastern quoll on parts of the south coast. And in uh, Gippsland Eden area, greater gliders. Um, next slide, thanks, Elise. Uh, so this is about detailed text as um, I, will, I will get, so I'll just talk to these dot points. So why is it important to protect unburned areas? And many people, particularly in government uh, and industry who we talk to, particularly after the La Nina, uh, two back-to-back -back La Nina periods, maybe a third one to come this coming summer, say, why do we have to focus on protecting unburnt or uh, low-intensity burnt forest and woodland after so many years of rain and um, cooler weather? Well, I think there are four. There are more that before I really want to talk about. One is these are critical habitat and refuge for wildlife. The great work of the federal government's expert panel that identified key important, um, uh, well, species which really relied on unburnt forest and habitats for the refuge to secure their populations, build up populations, um, particularly before the next big fire seasons uh, turn, uh, come around again, which of course they will. Often there's, thankfully, one of the great things about um, uh, uh, improved technology and satellite imagery and mapping is the modeling of climate refugia by governments, by academics, by NGOs, um, across, particularly across East, Eastern Australia, along the Great Dividing Range in the areas where there's altitudinal climate refugia and around water, for example, on floodplains, sheltered gullies around rock areas. Um, it's fascinating when you identify some of the areas that did not burn in the 2019, 2020 fires that provided bushfire refuge and might also provide refuge from uh, uh, heat waves in the future and low humidity. They are really critical to identify for protection. Many of those are in protected areas, public and private. But a lot of them are on private land where landowners may not have as much opportunity as they should to help uh, protect those refugia from um, uh, which are increasingly important as climate impacts worsen. Thirdly, um, those areas which did not burn are critical in repopulating the broader landscape matrix as trees and vegetation regrow after the fires, wildlife and seed banks and tropical banks that are were retained in those refugia um, are important uh, over the years and decades to help um, re-establish functioning ecosystems of high integrity outside. They're also very important for storing forest carbon and producing water in terms of influencing hydrological cycles. And some of these tall eucalypt forests, particularly in the wetter gullies, um, have got very significant forest carbon stores. There are also areas that are, have been targeted, for example, increased logging on public and private land and clearing, but they're also very much identified by local communities, key things they want to protect as local carbon stores. And increasingly large um, private sector operators are looking at 
private and public land which um, retain forest carbon as important in the um, climate change fight, particularly in the next eight years through to 2030. Fourthly, um, uh, building landscape resilience requires those areas where wildlife and ecosystems were maintained or largely maintained during the fires. And in, importantly, following the floods as well, particularly on the North Coast around Sydney and then Southeast Queensland. They're very important to help buffer our ecosystems, particularly if we think that in the future, we might get to two and a half, three degrees warming by the end of the century. Very significant climate shocks will come and those landscapes are very important to protect. Uh, apologies again for the background noise and I'll leave it there to Myla, thank you. Thanks, Stu. So I'm just gonna go over quickly what, what we mean by private land conservation for those of you that are very new to it. Um, in a nutshell, private land conservation involves a landholder voluntarily agreeing to conserve some or all of their land for biodiversity. Some options also uh, promote the conservation of the cultural values of the land, so particularly Aboriginal cultural heritage, but primarily they're, they're about biodiversity. And you can conserve your land in one of two key ways. So you could enter into some form of private conservation agreement with a provider, or you could register your property with a private conservation program without an agreement in place. Private land conservation agreements may be intended to last forever or for a set period of time. While the agreement's in place, the landholder is usually bound by that agreement and future owners of the land can also be bound by the agreement. Most agreements will restrict to some extent what can be done on the protected area. So it may not be possible to clear the land, to graze livestock or develop the land. And this is just so that biodiversity values are, are protected. Some agreements will have management plans attached and that they might require the landholder to undertake certain activities um, or management actions, such as controlling pests and weeds or fencing off land to exclude stock. And in that way, the biodiversity values of the land can be improved over time. In return for conserving some or all of their land, landholders can usually offer a range of support. And this varies depending on, on, the, on the private conservation scheme that they're participating in. Um, our providers will no doubt tell you all about that tonight. So the landholder and the provider tend to negotiate the agreement and any management actions required as well as any support that's going to be available to the landholder. So choosing the right option will depend very much on your personal preferences and your circumstances. The EDO can provide free initial legal advice to landholders who are considering entering one of the legally binding private conservation agreements. And you can apply for that advice through our website. If you're con seriously considering um, entering private land conservation, one of the binding me methods or some of the others, you may also need to seek tax and financial advice as well, depending on your circumstances. So there's a whole range of things that need to be weighed up when you're choosing an option. Um, obviously the level of protection for the land is, is a relevant consideration. Also the level of support that you'll be provided and like I said, most schemes provide some level of support ranging from education to peer support to technical support, and some provide quite considerable financial support as well. The duration of the agreement will also be relevant. Some landholders are keen to enter into agreements that last forever um, and that will bind future landholders, and others are, are, are more, more inclined to go with, with um, schemes that, are, that can be opted out of. Uh, startup costs are also a relevant consideration, um, and this can include the costs that you might need to um, seek financial advice, and maybe you might need to survey the land, that sort of thing. The land management requirements should also be factored into a decision. Um, these tend to be tailored to individual properties, but you would need to be able to fulfil the management um, actions that you've committed to. Potential impacts on the property value might also factor into your decision, but it's, it would be, it's, it's not the case that um, land, uh, private land conservation, you know, 
automatically reduces the value of your property. And a lot of people think that, but it, it, it is very much a circumstantial thing. Um, and some purchasers may be willing to pay a premium for land that is, is well protected. Um, another thing to consider is enforcement. So if the agreement's legally binding, you should look at what enforcement options are available to the provider. Um, and generally enforcement can range from anything from a warning right through to criminal prosecutions or, or what we call civil enforcement. Um, the non-binding options are not legally enforceable against you. So um, that's just another thing to consider. All of this is covered in our publication, A Guide to Private Land Conservation for Landholders in New South Wales. And that's available on our website. So everything you hear tonight is covered in a publication and we can make that available to you at the end. Okay, so the types of private land conservation, um, private land conservation available to landholders. Um, uh, there's, there's three options I'm going to cover first. Um, and these are provided through the New South Wales Biodiversity Conservation Trust. I'm going to provide a very brief overview of what they are. And then I'm gonna hand over to Kate and Toby from the trust to tell you more. So the first option that's available through the trust is a conservation agreement. This is an agreement between the landholder and the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. I'll call them the BCT uh, from now on. They can last forever, but they can also be for a fixed term. And they bind the landholder and any future landholders while they're in place. The trust, the trust is looking for certain types of, of land um, when it comes to these agreements. There's two types um, available through different BCT programs. Under the Conservation Partners Program, the area to be conserved should be at least 20 hectares, um, but smaller areas may be considered if they contain higher biodiversity values or meet other strategic priorities of the, of the trust. And under the Conservation Management Program, the land must meet the strategic priorities of the BCT. The agreement will be entered into voluntarily by the landholder, but once it's in place, it is binding on the landholder and future landholders. Um, it will be accompanied by a management plan that will set out the, um, the obligations of the landholder when it comes to managing their land for biodiversity outcomes. And they tend to be tailored very much to this, the specific property. Um, and they might do things like the management plan might restrict development and other activities or require certain um, management actions to improve the biodiversity values of the land. There's a lot of support that you can access through the BCT, and I'm sure they'll elaborate on that support when, when they talk to you in a minute. Um, but the support ranges from financial support um, right through to, to technical support and advice um, on, on land management activities. So the next option is called a biodiversity stewardship agreement. And this is made between the landholder and the New South Wales Environment Minister, and it's administered by the BCT. So these agreements provide for the permanent protection and management of biodiversity on the stewardship site, so on, on the area that's covered by the agreement. These agreements are a key component of the New South Wales Biodiversity Offsets scheme. And this is a market-based scheme that brings together landowners on the one hand who uh, create biodiversity credits by establishing um, biodiversity stewardship sites on their land and purchasers on the other hand who buy those credits to offset um, the negative impacts on biodiversity of any development or clearing that they've planned. So the Biodiversity Stewardship Agreement is intended to last forever and it's registered on the title to the property. It will bind future landowners. These kinds of agreements are, are probably most suited to properties that contain vegetation types or threatened species that are under development pressure. This way, it's more likely that there'll be a market for the credits that are generated by the agreement. They're entered into uh, voluntarily, but they're binding once they're in place and they will restrict 
the sort of activities that can be carried out on the land. And they'll also have a management plan that will set out the activities that the landholder needs to undertake uh, to improve the biodiversity values of the land. In order to receive ongoing funding through these agreements, the landholder needs to sell the biodiversity credits that are generated by the agreement. The credits can be sold to anyone, but it's easier to sell credits where there's a demand for that particular credit type. And credits are divided into species credits and, and ecosystem credits. There's two different types of credits available. Once credits are sold, a predetermined uh, proportion of, of that money called the total fund deposit has to be set aside in, and paid into a fund. And it's from that fund that the landholder will receive ongoing payments to meet the costs of their management actions that they've committed to as part of the agreement. Anything above that, that amount is a profit for the, for the landholder. And depending on the value of the credits, the profit can be considerable. Um, so these, these, these agreements can actually you know, provide quite a bit of, uh, can provide some, a, a fair bit of income for the, for the landholder. And there's other support available through the BCT as well. And the final option um, available is a wildlife refuge agreement. Um, and these agreements are also made with uh, the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. Um, they, are, unlike the other two, they can sort of they're an opt out any time situation. So they're, they're binding while they're in place that the, the landholder can terminate at any time. Um, to be eligible, the land should contain high conservation values or be a minimum of 10 hectares. And the BCT is also looking for properties that are in moderate or better condition, ecological condition, are managed primarily for conservation and properties that can contribute to landscape connectivity, such as wildlife corridors. So like the other agreements that are negotiated between the landholder and the BCT, um, they might restrict development and they might um, require certain activities to be undertaken. Uh, landholders can also access a range of support for these agreements as well. So I'm going to hand over to Kate and Toby to tell you more about these options. I think they're going to share their screen. Hi all, hopefully you can see me and hear me. And I'll just uh, share my screen, just bear with me. Start this from the beginning. Sorry, folks, I have a little bit of a um, black line, and maybe while I'm just starting this slideshow, I'll just introduce myself. So, thank you so much for having us today. My name is Kate Smiley, I'm the manager of um, private land conservation programs with the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. And uh, like Jamila has mentioned, I might call us the, G the BCT from here onwards, just to make it a bit easier to speak. Um, it is fantastic to see so many people online. I think the last time I saw um, the participants, we had over 80 people, so it's great to have you. Um, it's fantastic to be here. I'm usually located on Bundjalung country in northern New South Wales, and we have our regional manager for southeast um, or southeast New South Wales joining us, Toby. Um, so I'll be I'll hand over to Toby about halfway through, and if you just bear with me, I'm going to try and remove. Um, I've got a bar in a bit of tech issue. Sorry, guys. Kate, I think you just need to select, select um, presenter mode. Oh, yes, I've just got a um, bar sitting in, in front of that. Um, oh. Janella, sorry, it's just to do with the Zoom. So I'm just trying to minimise out of Zoom um, if I can. Yes, I can't get to that particular. Um, just see. Maybe Toby, do you want to introduce yourself while I'm just trying to minimise the Zoom um, function that's sitting in front of the slideshow for me? Cool. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Toby Edmonds. I'm currently acting as the regional manager in Southeast region um, for the regional delivery team. So 
Um, I'm coming to you from Ngunnawal in the Gambri country down here in Queanbeyan. Um, and a big part of our role is, is to deliver those conservation agreements that um, Jamila and that Kate is about to speak about um, on ground. So the team that I work with um, are the ones who go out and do the site assessments, um, meet with landholders, do the landholder support um, for people who have existing agreements and do the assessments and provide grants um, for some of those agreement holders. But it looks like Kate is on. I can't see your presentation, but... Can people see my presentation now? No. We will get there. Um, how about now? No? Are you down the bottom if you're... Yes, I am sharing. Um, let's just try. Oh, wait. That. That's it. Yep. Great. So good. Thanks, folks. And um, hopefully you can't see, can, you can all see the presentation. Okay, thank you so much for your patience. Sorry about that. We were always going to have a tech issue and tonight it was me. Um, so from, uh, so as Jamila's done a great job in uh, outlining the types of agreements that we provide. So we thought, Toby and I thought we'd give you a, more of an overview around the BCT, um, our organisation, as well as our programs. Um, and to kick off, we were established under the Biodiversity Conservation Act in 2016, so we actually commenced operations in 2017. And the purpose under the Biodiversity Conservation Act for us is to encourage landholders to enter into agreements for the conservation and management of biodiversity, is to deliver a strategic offsetting service, and to promote public knowledge, appreciation and understanding of biodiversity and the importance of conserving biodiversity. As we run through, we've got three types of agreements. So we offer biodiversity stewardship agreements, we offer conservation agreements and the wildlife refuge agreements. And we've been supported by an incredible government investment of uh, $70 million per annum. Uh, and that's for our private land conservation program. And then in addition to that, we also receive payments to um, offset biodiversity impacts. This map showing you how we uh, deliver our program. So we actually have seven regions. As you can see there along the coast, we've got our North Coast region, Sydney, Hunter and Southeast, which is where Toby's calling in. Uh, we've, in, the, in central New South Wales, we have Northern England, Central West, Murray Riverina, and then we have a Western uh, region. These regions generally reflect the local land services areas. So for those of you who are familiar with local land services or have um, entered into activities with them before, these our regions are generally aligned. So this slide showing you that we actually have some frameworks that uh, guide our business. On the left hand side is um, the front cover of the Biodiversity Conservation Investment Strategy. This is a strategy that's developed by the New South Wales Government and its key purpose is to be guiding the, where private land conservation investment should be occurring within New South Wales. It includes priority investment areas and investment principles as well as um, identifying key conservation assets. And so that's, that, that strategy really guides our private land conservation investment, that $70 million investment that we receive each year from the government. We also have a business plan. We've just updated our next four year business plan. And that business plan outlines our vision as well as our strategic goals. And on the left hand of the slide, what you'll be seeing here is um, some information about the biodiversity offset scheme. So the offset scheme is actually um, governed by the legislation by the Biodiversity Conservation Act and the regulations. And we, we um, have roles and functions uh, in, to do with delivering or facilitating the delivery of biodiversity offset agreements, those BSAs. We have three key program areas and we'll talk to you a bit about these um, this evening. So we have conservation management program and it's under that program where we offer the conservation agreements that are either in perpetuity or termed. And those agreements um, come with annual conservation management payments for the length of the agreement. We also have a conservation partners program and under this program, we offer the partnership conservation agreements and also wildlife refuges. The partnership agreements here, are the conservation agreements are in perpetuity. Um, and the agreements under this program are supported by grants, a, um, a grant program. And on the right hand side of the slide is our biodiversity offset program, where we um, assist landholders to be entering into biodiversity stewardship agreements. 
but we also purchase um, credits under that program as well. So we'll talk to you a bit more about that. We thought we'd pop this slide up as a, what does a typical agreement look like? Um, really what this is trying to show you is that it's really up to the landholder to be working with the BCT as to what part of the property that you'd like to be putting under a conservation agreement and managing for biodiversity. Um, the, the template, there is a template agreement. And so for those of you who are interested, the agreement's available on our website. You can have a look at what, what the, the standard agreements look like for a conservation agreement or a biodiversity stewardship agreement. Um, and the agreement actually identifies how that area is to be managed and whether there's any conservation management activities that are required. As I mentioned before, people who are entering into our partnership conservation agreements and wildlife refuges are, are able to access grants, which are a three year grant program. Um, and then there's landholders under the conservation management program and the biodiversity offset program that can access conservation agreements and biodiversity stewardship agreements with the ongoing annual management funding. So this slide's just gonna talk a little bit about the biodiversity, uh, sorry, the um, conservation partners program. So under this program, landholders can make an application at any time for an in perpetuity conservation agreement or a wildlife refuge. As I mentioned, there's grants available to manage the conservation areas and the types of activities that are generally eligible are things such as weed and pest control, fencing to control access to stock and addressing impacts from fires and floods. The grants are also made available for people who register with the Land for Wildlife program, which we're hearing a little bit more about, and also for landholders who register with the Humane Society International Wildlife Land Trust program. So, so far, we've, um, since the BCT commenced in 2017, we've issued over 300 grants for a value of about $8.5 million, and we've paid 3.9 of that to date. And that's just reflecting that they are three year grants. And the map on the right hand side is showing you what the level of activity where we have conservation agreements and wildlife refuges. So, the dark colour is the um, in perpetuity conservation agreements, and that lighter colour is our wildlife refuge agreements. So far in the last four years, we've all, yeah, coming on, for, um, coming on a bit longer, we've uh, entered into 107, over 170 in perpetuity agreements, protecting almost 35,000 hectares under, this, um, under the Conservation Partner Program. And we have a, a, currently have over 200 applications in progress. The chart down in the bottom right-hand corner is just showing you a bit of progress over the last, um, since 2017, uh, shown on financial year so the line is showing you the number of agreements and those bars are showing you the area that's been protected under this program each financial year. I'll just move not, not now on to the conservation management program. So this is the program where landholders receive an annual conservation management payment for the protection and active management of the conservation areas. We have a number of different offers that we make available and they tend to be announced each year. Each financial year we'll announce our offers and they're a mix of what we call conservation tenders, which are a reverse auction. We also have a fixed price offer where we, um, we, we have a schedule that we're willing to pay in terms of those conservation management payments and we have a revolving fund and the co-investment partnership stream. Um, so information about where these are uh, made available across the state are posted on our website. Um, and the fixed price offer is actually generally available um, for, to submit an expression of interest at any time. So far, we've had 17 conservation tenders. We've had six rounds of fixed price offers. Um, and we're, we're um, as that site is showing, the average payment across the state is $113 per hectare. There's a lot of information on our website around the different types of payments and the payment ranges. Um, so that information is all readily available. So far, we've, we, there's a very unique aspect about the BCT. We actually have a, um, the ability to invest now the monies that are needed to be paid for the terms of the agreements, building an endowment fund. This really is a game changer from our perspective in terms of private land conservation options and really providing those secure payments to landholders over the term of their agreement. So, so far we've had um, $161 million has been invested supporting these conservation agreement payments. The map on the right hand side is showing you the activity that's been occurring since 2017 in this program. Um, and the different coloured dots, in, um, locations or dots on agreements, sorry, on that map are actually showing in perpetuity agreements to termed agreements. 
So far in, since establishment, we've entered into 146 agreements, protecting almost 79,000 hectares, and we have a further 82,000 um, hectares and 27 agreements approved, which means that means that they're in process. And again, you can see there on the bottom right-hand side, that graph is showing you the number of activities, uh, so the number of agreements is the line. And then those bar graphs are showing you in perpetuity agreements and termed agreements. The dark green are the in perpetuity, the light green is the termed, and the each year um, the area being protected per annum. I'm going to pass over to Toby from here. Thanks, Kate. So I'll probably talk a little bit about our biodiversity offsets program. Um, and these, as um, Kate and Jamila said before, these are the agreements called biodiversity stewardship agreements that are the mechanism that we use to offset impacts elsewhere in New South Wales. So there's basically a, a biodiversity stewardship agreement will generate a unit called a biodiversity credit. And those units are sort of broadly broken down into ecosystem credits, which represent vegetation type um, and species credits. And species credits are things like individual plant species um, or fauna species such as, you know, koalas or gliders or, you know, bird habitat and things like that. So once, once a biodiversity stewardship has been put in place, those credits are, are generated for a particular ecosystem type or a particular species. Um, usually both, and then those credits can be sold either to somebody who's having an impact at a development site, um, or they can be sold to the Biodiversity Conservation Trust, and I'll talk a bit about that in a tick, or they can be sold essentially as an investment because they're a, they're a unit that um, has a monetary value attached and so it can be traded like any other commodity. When I say that the BCT buys credits, one of the things under the Biodiversity Conservation Act is when developers have an impact, they also generate um, an offset liability that's measured in those same credit units. And so at that point, the developer has two options. They can either go out to the market and buy those credits directly from a landholder, um, or they can choose to pay for the value of those credits and they pay that money to the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. In doing that, they meet their offset obligation and then the Biodiversity Trust Conservation Trust takes that money that we were given and we go out and find those credits from the market. Um, and that was set up um, primarily so that we have cases of small individual credit sales being made for maybe you know one or two credits here and there. But it's not necessarily economically viable to go and set up a whole agreement just for one or two credits. Um, those credits can be pooled with us through the Biodiversity Conservation Trust and we can take that pool of money and go and buy uh, you know, credits from, from a larger conservation agreement. Do you mind going to the next slide, please, Kate? Um, so again, you can see this map on the right-hand side. Um, obviously, as you would expect, this is an offset scheme and you can see where a lot of the development impacts are and the ecosystem types and the species credits where that impact. Um, is concentrated and that's also the same area where our offsets are being generated. We are seeing an uptick in the number of offsets that are coming in, um, you know, in inland and that's, you know, mostly through mining but also through developments, you know, around the major centres and those sorts of things. Probably the only other point to make there, and, and Jamila sort of touched on that a bit before, was that when you draft a biodiversity stewardship agreement, there's a really detailed plan of management that goes in to all of the management actions that you need to do to generate those credits. 
each of those management actions are costed at, at what it would cost at sort of standard contractor rates. Um, and those costings go into what's called a total fund deposit. So when somebody sells their enough credits to reach 100% of that total fund deposit value, then that site goes from what's called a passive mode to an active mode. And all of those active management actions then come into force and the money gets paid to the landholder on an annual basis for each of those management actions to do the work. If the market allows and you can sell your credits at a high enough price um, that, that you can make more money than what is required for the total fund deposit, then you as the landholder get to keep that, um, that profit margin. But the first responsibility is to meet 100% of the total fund deposit. And once that happens, the site goes active and, um, and you can start managing. So again, just some stats there. We've got, well, probably more than 230 landholders now have entered into stewardship agreements um, and 36,000 hectares protected. This is the big one is the 8.8 .8 million that we're paying annually um, to landholders to manage their land. We have an increasing amount of developers who are paying into the fund as the offset scheme um, really starts to kick in. And one of the things that the BCT tries to do is meet our offset obligations when people pay into the fund, um, try and meet that with the like for like rules. That's the, the highest standard of offsetting. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Kate? Probably that, um, that yep, nope, back, one more. Yep, thanks. Um, the only other point I wanted to touch on, and this is, this is something we do a lot of in regional delivery, is the landholder support program. So um, not just for BSAs, but as Kate said, for all of our conservation management programs, our, our funded conservation agreements, um, they have an annual audit as well. I should have mentioned that, that's the same with BSAs. Every year we go out and audit those, those sites and work with the landholders um, to see how they're meeting their management obligations. Um, we use adaptive management if we need to. Sometimes there's new and emerging weeds that, that weren't predicted at the time of the assessment and we need to work with landholders to deal with those problems. Obviously, climatic, conditions change um, and those sorts of things. So we do that for our funded agreements, but we also do that for our unfunded conservation agreements as well. And we get our landholders ringing up, you know, with all sorts of questions about their land, about what's living on their land, about new and emerging weeds, um, you know, and help with grants and those sorts of things. And so that is a big part um, of what regional delivery does in the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. So if it, that's probably it for that slide. You can see obviously from that map on the right hand side, there's a lot of dots. And we, you know, each of those dots, when you look at them, represents a site visit, particularly when you look out. Um, in Western New South Wales. So our, our Central West and Western team and our Murray River Arena team clock up the most number of kilometers and hours in the car to drive out to each one of those landholders, meet them on site, take the time to talk to them about how things are going and, and what their needs are. So it's, it is a big part of our program um, and something that we, you know, we're continually working on, on how to do better and how to um, provide more access to field days and, and connect up landholders. Toby, can you hear us? Yeah. 
Looks might, like he's frozen cage. I might, I might keep moving through. Great for the BCT. We bought you the tech issues this evening. <laughs> so Toby's um, back, I think. Oh, you're back. Great, Toby. I'll just move oh, to the Oh no, he's frozen again. <laughs> okay, we'll move to the next slide. I'll um I might finish off on the this slide then. It's our final slide. This, this is really just to provide a bit of an overview on how to find out more information about the BCT. So there's a lot of information on our website. Um, this slide shows it provides a link to those different program areas. So we have a different web page and um, supporting materials for the conservation partner program, the conservation management program, our biodiversity offset program. There's also a page um, explaining more about the landholder support program. And um, we also have a landholder guide on taxation issues. So we'll make sure that the link is uploaded to that as well. And that can just um, provide, as Jamila mentioned, everybody's circumstances uh, are different when it comes to taxation issues. So the BCT has provided a bit of guide um, to help landholders and your financial advisors um, as to how to navigate some of the different taxation treatment um, of entering into agreements and also receipt of payments under some of our agreements. We also have a website where you can, a web page where you can hear from other landholders who have entered into agreements with the BCT, as well as landholders who entered agreements before the BCT. Um, so there's a series of videos and also written landholder stories. And um, if you'd like to find out or hear from other people who have entered agreements with us, we'd really encourage you to visit that page. And I'm pretty sure that is it from us. So thank you so much for now. I'm sure we'll um, see you all again at question time. Thank you very much, Kate and Toby. We're going Thanks, to Kate. hand over now to John Asworth from the Community Environment Network. We'll just hold a minute while Elise gets the other PowerPoint back up to John. Good. John, over to you. Land for Wildlife. You'll need to come off mute. I was hitting the wrong button. Right, uh, well, hello folks. Uh, my name's John Asquith. Yes, I coordinate Land for Wildlife for the Community Environment Network. And I've been doing so since about 2007 when we took over the program from then National Parks. Um, and, but prior to that, we're involved in the pilot program. So Land for Wildlife has been in New South Wales since about 2002. And it's been in existence. It started with Birds Victoria and the Victorian government about 40 years ago. And so they are the, uh, the trailblazers and uh, done the protocols and so what have you. So look, it really, um, one of the things I explain to people about Land for Wildlife, it's, it's, a, it's a network of like-minded people who are essentially in a club that they can join or not join or leave or whatever. But it's based essentially on a system of handshakes. We, the agreements are really no more substantial than a handshake. But however, they do build confidence, they build positivity, they build uh, an engagement. And it's, a, it's what we see as a first step in conservation to overcome you know, the idea that the environment is threatening or any work on threatened species are going to cost you money or whatever. So we're really keen to build positive relationships. And that's really as far as Land for Wildlife goes. We hope and pray it then leads on to greater things such as BCT or HSI or others, you know. So there's a voluntary opt-out at any time. Uh, landholders do sign an agreement uh, and we need that because we really can't enter people's details in our database and so on uh, without their approval. Um, but in recognition of that they do get a copy of the report which is a very light um, it's about five page uh, tick box largely report that on their property but however by, they also get the sign and the sign that the little girl is holding there is uh, is treated like gold by many landowners and um, there's a lot of jealousy between landowners if one gets a land for wildlife property sign on their front gate and the neighbor doesn't and we've had in the past uh, landholders saying to us, well, why did they get the sign? Because my property is better, which is great from our marketing point of view. You know, they, we say, well, gee, we're sorry. We'll, 
we'll get there and sort it out, you know. Um, so it's pretty simple. It's half a hectare of good quality bushland, and that's habitat for uh, native wildlife. The definition of good quality bushland is set by our regional providers. So in each local government area, we either have a regional provider or we cover by using one from an, a nearby area, or in some cases, we use our own staff who run our bush regen team. So Rob does a round if, uh, if once we collect enough people who want to be in, but we don't have a regional provider. And the reason we do that is the way we see an application to join Land for Wildlife. So it's an expression of interest. It's Well, the way I explain that to people is the landholder has put their hand out to shake your hand. You can't ignore that. You can't be slow about responding. So it's really important you grab their hand and shake it and say, great, you're on board. And so we do that by once we get an application, we very quickly get a letter out saying, oh, I received your application, wonderful. You wanna be part of the program. We, we do have resource limitations, staff, et cetera, but we will be back to you within you know three months typically. And here's a contact detail a uh, number or email address if you have any concerns in the meantime, but we will get back to you. That step is so important because like I say, it's like someone's held their hand out to shake yours. And if you wait a month to shake the hand back or a couple of months or a year, believe you me, they're not really interested in shaking your hand again. Um, the legal obligations, it's not legally binding, but the landholder signs are essentially an aspirational uh, agreements that says that, well, they will endeavour to manage their property um, uh, sustainably. We encourage them to join the local group. So many of our regional partners are environment organisations, land care networks or the like, and we want them to join those groups because A, it builds the group, and B, it gets them an automatic invitation to workshops and so on, and, and councils as well. Some of the councils of, uh, on the North Coast and, uh, and the Southern Highlands are tremendous in the support they provide. So CEN's role is one of mentor, marketer, and supporting it through a system of legal uh, regional providers. The BCT provides us some, with some grant funding, and currently that's running at, uh, so we award between six and seven grants per month to landholders, and we try to spread them out across the state. So each of those, seven BCT regions will uh, we'll see, um, we'll see some grants go through. Next one, please. So what have our achievements been? Um, so uh, this is sort of, it, it's, you know, takes a lot of marketing by people to do this, but we built, our job is to build up the strength of our regional providers and then they will follow it up. And, you know, they tell me that the grants program is wonderful and they're very proud of being in land for wildlife. So there's they roughly uh, cover 65 council areas plus the ACT, we cover that as well. Um, and, and like I said, we can cover any local government area in the state if we get enough applications. Currently sitting at about 2,570 as of a couple of weeks ago, about 191,000 hectares, that's a total property area. The vegetated area, which is what we're interested in, and that vegetated area is a high quality bushland. And in that can contain exotics, you know, camphor laurels on the north coast. I always tell people about there's, you know, no one's going to get rid of the um, campers up in, uh, you know, Byron or Lismore. They're part of the what's left of the rainforests up there. So that roughly runs, that's been running about that figure for a long time, but about 50% of the total area we sign up. And then the area being re rehabilitated, which can be management actions, fencing of riparian area, planting, planting trees, any management action that um, uh, by a landholder is included in that. And so that's, that's again, about the one eighth, about 12%. 12, 12%. 12%. The annual growth rate is slowing a little bit, just the you know, diminishing returns laws. And uh, so that's sitting at about uh, 8%. Next one, please. <clears throat> so what does CN do? Um, and that comes down, most of that comes down to me. I have a volunteer who works with me a day a week. So she does the registrations. 
So it's see, uh, um, land for wildlife is a process. So people put in an expression of interest. We talk to them. We assess their property. When I say we, I include the, obviously that's the regional providers and assessors. We go out there. We give them a report. We give them a sign, assuming everything's okay, and then we get you know take them into the fold. So we we promote and market the program, um, and I do that through councils and land care and environment organisations or grants or projects. We uh, we train the regional providers, and so you can see that happy group there. You may recognise some of the people. That's a training session we ran about a month ago uh, down in Goulburn, and um, we run it at sea and produces an annual newsletter on land for wildlife. Um, funding is always a constraint on us, so our newsletter is four A4 coloured pages posted out. Um, so that ends up being pretty expensive with, um, you know, when you've got two and a half thousand. Um, we, so what does the system? So we register new landholders once they're assessed and approved. We send them welcome letters. We manage the database because, um, you know, things come and go. And we monitor the QA of assessment. So what we've done in more recent times is improve the quality of the uh, of the assessments that come back in order that they are consistent and useful and able to and they do they do contain the assessment does look at any opportunities where the with the landholders agreement it's referred to the bct for further following up uh meta, i we do mentoring of participants and this is one of the advantages of being a grandfather people like to talk talk to you and tell you their problems and some of them about land for wildlife, but if it's limiting, uh, you know, their ability to work, well, I got big ears, you know. So uh, we provide the signs. So usually we order them in bulk every couple of years, 400, 400 signs at a time. Uh, and we just provide them as people bring up and say, I need another 10, we post them out. And we share resources. So we really encourage both um, all the groups we work with and to share resources. So if people want information on nest boxes, we'll send them info on nest boxes from national parks or HSI or anyone. You know, we don't try and do that. We try and be a, a resource and, and a way for people to get information. I think that summarizes it. Thank you. Thanks, John. That's a great overview. And I see those signs all over the place now. So and see the impact you're having. Good, thank We're you. going to hear now from Helen Church from Humane Society International, who's going to tell us about Wildlife Land Trust. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Helen. I manage the Wildlife Land Trust. Uh, this is Humane Society International's uh, private land conservation program. Um, for those of you who don't know, Humane Society International is an animal welfare and conservation charity. Um, and we have a, quite a lot of wildlife uh, protection, habitat protection programs in Australia. And the Wildlife Land Trust is one of these. Um, so the Wildlife Land Trust is ma mainly focused on inclusivity. Uh, our agreements are non-binding, just like Land for Wildlife's. Um, they're fairly flexible, so we can work with different landholders on what they want to achieve. And they're completely free, so our whole program is uh, at no cost to any members. Uh, we have around 800 members in Australia at the moment. Um, they range from one acre to several thousand, and uh, they protect land for any species, common and endangered, and any sorts of habitats as well. Um, we also, also um, have a lot of mixed use properties uh, in our network. So we have plenty of wildlife sharers. Um, a lot of farmers who are looking to manage their land more sustainably. And we also have quite a lot of uh, ecotourism operators. Um, basically, if you're considering managing your land for the benefit of wildlife and their habitat, um, you're more than welcome to join. Um, since our agreements are non-binding, uh, our members can opt out of this program at any time, there are no legal obligations or costs to that. Um, if they choose to sell their sanctuary, it's a very easy process. 
um, we can just sort of pass on the agreement to the new owners and most new owners are really happy to do this. Um, our program is also designed to complement any other agreements. So um, any of the agreements you've heard today uh, can definitely work alongside a wildlife land trust agreement. And we can also work with our members to uh, encourage them to step up protection for their land and explore other options that might be available to them. Um, so our members are part of a community uh, of wildlife friendly landholders. Uh, basically, our support is with connecting people to like-minded landholders, um, allowing people to share stories about their sanctuaries and the wildlife they see there. And uh, through this process, uh, teaching them more and giving them the opportunity to learn more about the local species in their area and how to preserve them. Um, they also receive a property sign, which has our logo on it, which is fantastic. Um, it's a really great way to connect with their neighbors. And uh, uh, just like with Land for Wildlife, it often starts a good conversation with neighbors about uh, private land conservation and all the benefits that that gives. Um, our members also receive uh, advice from our ecologists. They can receive support for conservation issues. Uh, this can be both within their property and in their local community. Um, and our members do have access to grants, including the BCT's uh, Conservation Partners Grants, as well as HSI's uh, Disaster Response Funds. Um, with the Wildlife Land Trust, we also have some really fantastic programs which help us to support our members' conservation efforts. Uh, so the first one is our uh, Sanctuaries for Sale program. Uh, with this, we can promote your property uh, to like-minded buyers so you can find someone who shares your values and will carry on your conservation goals um, to buy your property. We also have a really fantastic program called Sanctuaries You Can Stay. And with this, we promote uh, any accommodation or tourism operations that our members may have to uh, our HSI supporters and other air, uh, members of our community. Um, this is really great. It gives uh, our members an opportunity to share uh, their, their sanctuary with people and, and get themselves a little income. And it's also a really fantastic resource for anyone who is looking to travel but wants to support uh, environmentally friendly local businesses. Um, yeah, so it's really fantastic for everyone involved. Um, so basically, this is a really great option for people who want to protect land um, on their properties, but don't want to be locked into any legal obligations or pay any fees or have any changes made to their uh, property's title. Um, it's also a really great option for people who may not fit the criteria of some of those more uh, intense agreements. So it's nice and casual and uh, very inclusive for anyone that is interested in joining. Um, and joining is very easy. So you can just head to our website. Uh, it's wildlifelandtrust.org.au. And it's just an online application form and we can take it from there really. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. That was great. Um, I think we have one more to cover and it's going to be me. So the last option to talk about is an Indigenous Protected Area or IPA. So this is an agreement um, between the traditional owners of land or sea country and the Australian government. Um, and they're really about conserving land um, as well as the cultural values of land um, from any particular threat state. They, they are a protected area. They join the protected areas network once they're, um, once they're made, the agreement's made and there will be a management plan to, to help manage any, any threats to, um, to the, the land and the cultural values of the land. These agreements can be great at, at helping Indigenous communities to not only protect the cultural values of their country for future generations, but also to generate health, education, economic and social benefits as well. The, there's no real sort of um, set uh, program for these um, agreements. They tend to be ne negotiated between um, the particular 
traditional owners of the land or sea country and the government. They can vary. The agreement itself will set out how long it's, it's intended to last. Um, and they're supported, the agreements are supported through a multi-year funding agreement with the government. Um, many Indigenous organisations also supplement this funding through fee-for-service or other income generating activities. So they might run tours on the IPA and show people some of their cultural sites or um, some particularly um, high conservation value areas that are, that, that are being protected by the IPA. Um, there's no real application process either. It's just something that kind of happens between the traditional owners and the, the government. Um, but definitely worth keeping in mind because these make a, a huge contribution to, um, to conservation in Australia. So one more thing before we get on to our questions is a quick note from us in WWF to say we're publishing another guide and this one's on the carbon market for private landholders. Um, so we looked at the carbon market as a possible alternative pathway for private landholders to benefit from uh, protecting unburnt trees on their land. But when we looked into it, we found that in general, there's really limited opportunities available um, protecting intact and existing vegetation. And that's because having unburnt forests uh, on your land is generally not enough to meet the integrity and the eligibility requirements, um, particularly if the current management of the land um, or the uses of the land would, would retain those trees in the landscape. Um, Having said that, the guide does provide an overview of, of both the regulated national carbon market, which is administered by the Clean Energy Regulator, um, and the domestic and international voluntary carbon market, as well as possible co-benefit opportunities for projects that, that deliver on both biodiversity and carbon benefits. So um, you can go to our website for more information. Um, it's going to be available soon on our website in, just by searching Defending the Unburnt. So just a reminder that all the options we've just discussed are covered in our comprehensive guide to private conservation for New South Wales landholders, um, where we look at, the, um, at each option in detail. Um, and you can find that on our website. You can either search it up in Google or you can follow the QR code if you're technologically minded. Um, and that should take you to the, the right place on our website, um, which I must confess is pretty huge. <laughs> and you could don't go down many rabbit holes um, if you're not careful. Um, and we're happy to move on, Elise. We would also appreciate it if you're minded to, to follow that QR code, um, which will allow you to evaluate this presentation. We like to um, get our, our feedback from our communities. Um, so you can follow the QR code and that will take you to a, a little online form, will take you a few minutes to fill out. And um, we'd really appreciate um, any feedback. So I think it's time to hand over some questions and Elise did you have one to kick us off? Yeah fantastic thanks so much to all the panelists really enjoyed hearing from you and it's so exciting to hear about all the opportunities everyone has to yeah look after their land. Um, I might start with a question that I might actually just quickly answer if that's okay. Um, we've got some people joining from other states who asked if these options are available for them. Um, so I just want to note that this session is kind of focused on New South Wales, um, but we will be running a session on Queensland and a session on Victoria later in the year. Um, and those last three um, agreements that we covered, so the Indigenous Protected Areas, Land for Wildlife and Wildlife Land Trust are available nationally. Um, so you can look into more detail on those in our guide, as Jem mentioned, um, but those are available everywhere in Australia. Um, so I might start with a question for the BCT. Um, sorry, let me just pull up the questions here. Um, so someone has asked for some examples of legal and tax issues that landholders should consider. And I wondered, is this the kind of thing that would be covered in that um, guide that you mentioned, Kate? 
Hi, yes, there's a pretty comprehensive guide on our website that would talk about, um, it talks about taxation um, and other issues. So there is some information there about taxation treatment for grants, but there's also some information in there about other kinds of concessions that are available to landholders who enter into conservation agreements and in perpetuity agreements. Um, so yeah, because everybody's situation is different, it's probably great if we just refer to that guide. It's available under the resources, um, uh, the resources section on the BCT website. Fantastic, thanks Kate. Thanks. Um, another question for BCT, um, I think this might be one for Toby on the offset program. Um, so sort of a two part question. Firstly, are the offset credits like for like? So are you offsetting for the same species? Um, and what happens if the landholder loses their land in a fire or um, yeah, degrades for some other reason? Do Does that company have to find the offsets another way? No, so I mean, the first part of that is that yes, we, the offset scheme is set up for like for like. So um, as I said before, there's ecosystem credits and, and the way that they're traded is that, for example, if you're clearing um, a box gum woodland, for example, you can only buy and sell credits within a, a particular geographic area. So it's it's by Ibra subregions that might adjoin the area of impact so that you don't have, um, it, it minimizes the risk that people are offsetting somewhere far away from where the impact site is. It's still within the broad Ibra subregion, so it's not, it's not constrained to local government area, but it is also constrained by um, what's called vegetation class by threat level, um, and then also within an Ibra subregion. So it, it can become quite complicated. That's the primary trading rule for like for like for ecosystem credits. Species credits, and the case that, that, um, that Eva has asked um, is the case of koalas. Species credits can be traded anywhere across the state. Um, and I think the second part of that question was about what happens when you, like you set up a biodiversity stewardship site and then that, that site might be affected by fire. And we definitely had that after 2019 um, and there's a there's a force majeure clause in the conservation agreement to say that if you, you the biodiversity values are lost off that site through a force majeure event and probably Jamila um, you are probably better placed to explain how force majeure events work and what the criteria are but my understanding is that that it's a natural disaster type event that um, is outside of the control of the landholder. And in those cases, we work with the landholders to restore that habitat within the bounds of the funding that they have. And the view is that these are in perpetuity agreements. And so yes, the biodiversity values might be lost from that site, but the site is conserved in perpetuity. And then our job is to work with landholders to bring that back. Um, in, in the best way possible. And, you know, we've seen that again, using koalas as an example, we've seen koala habitat come back, particularly around the, you know, the Kuma Numerala area in, in our Southeast part of the world and probably on the North coast as well, that yes, it's lost for a time, but the in perpetuity nature of it and the in perpetuity funding means that, that we can continue to manage it. And, and restore it. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I think that's um, awesome to sort of allow landholders that flexibility, but also, yeah, the funding is a fantastic aspect of that to allow that regeneration and support that. So really great option for landholders. Um, all right, another question I've got is for Helen with HSI. Um, someone has asked if HSI does site visits, if there's sort of a threshold requirement for the biodiversity value of a site, do you come out and assess that? Um, unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to uh, conduct site visits for our members. Uh, we do conduct a, a sort of desktop assessment um, once we receive their application form. And we do endeavour to visit as many sanctuaries as possible once they've become members. But um, 
yeah, at the moment it's it's sort of self-reported almost. So people can let us know which species that they've spotted on the land and the sorts of habitats that they preserve on that property. And um, we kind of just take that at face value, really. Fantastic, thank you. And as you said, that's a really great positive of HSI's scheme, right? So it's sort of open to everyone. Um, all right, I've got another question, potentially for BCT, but um, yeah, maybe could go to everyone really. Someone's asked, how can they make sure that their agreement would bind um, future landholders, so people that um, might later buy the property or after someone's passed on? Um, there are there specific um, agreements that bind to the title? Yeah, so in, in the case of the BCT agreements, the ones that do bind on title are the biodiversity stewardship agreements um, and both the funded and unfunded conservation agreements. So they're registered on the title and that means they run with the title of the land. Whoever buys or owns or inherits that land in the future will own that conservation agreement and the management requirements for that. Um, that's essentially how we, we guarantee it. Um, in the case of wildlife refuges, they are noted on title, but they can be removed from title. And that makes it sound like it's a really easy thing to do. And we do get, particularly with legacy wildlife refuges, where they might have been established even before the National Parks and Wildlife Act. Um, and perhaps some of that land has been subdivided since then. Some of it might not have the biodiversity values. And so landholders apply to us to remove those wildlife refuges. And we have a program to do that. But what that involves is actually going to the Minister for the Environment. It's not something we can do in-house within the BCT. And from the Minister from the Environment actually goes to the Governor of New South Wales and we have to get um, her to do that. So it, it is quite a process. It's not, it, it's not a matter of just switching it off, um, but it can be done. Yep. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I'll remind everyone that the details of all the agreements covered today are in um, the guide on the EDO website and it will say sort of how long each agreement lasts so you can double check um, there yourself after the session. Um, all right, sorry to keep throwing you um, in the line but we have another question for BCT. Um, so you've mentioned a plan of management that might be attached to a few agreements. Is this written by the landholder? Or is this written by BCT? What's sort of the process um, for this management plan? So those management plans are, they're written in conjunction with the landholder, but I guess um, there's minimum requirements for them. So if you start with BSA, Biodiversity Stewardship Agreements, for example, the offset agreement, the way the credits are calculated is based on how much improvement you're going to see at that site over 20 years and then into the future. And so you need to make sure that the management actions that are written into the plan will achieve those gains. And sometimes where we have those negotiations with landholders might be around, you know, you might need a certain management action to achieve a certain gain, which will generate credits. If the landholder is not happy with that management action, then that will result, we can take that management action out, but it will result in a reduction in credit yield. Um, in the case of funded conservation agreements through our tenders and fixed price offices, we have, we have standard management actions that relate to grazing and weed control and pest control. And what happens is you essentially have two options. You have a a basic required management action. And that, that can be in the case of grazing, if it's a grassy ecosystem site, we will allow grazing under our grazing guidelines, but that is only done, that's, that's a standard management action that they have to meet the grazing guidelines. If they choose the additional management action, which is to remove grazing altogether, 
they get an increase in their biodiversity value score for that. And therefore their property in a tender sense will become more competitive because it will, it will generate a higher biodiversity value score. So it is always a voluntary discussion with the landholder about what they enter into, but the management actions themselves are, are fairly standardized and fairly fixed. So that particularly in a tender sense, when you're comparing one landholder to another landholder, those management actions are, are the same and you're comparing the same the same level of input. Fantastic, thank you. That's really helpful to talk through. Um, I just want to quickly clear up um, in the chat, we've had someone say um, they've understood as they bear the risk of bushfire if they enter into an offset agreement. I just want to clarify, and Toby can hopefully back me up here, um, when we were speaking of force majeure before, if a bushfire happens on your land and you have an offset agreement, there's sort of a clause available to protect you. So you're not liable for that event happening. Um, and the BCT has funding to sort of support you um, in that circumstance. Is that correct, Toby? I, I think that question is about the liability of a fire being generated on the property. And I'd probably have to take that on notice unless Kate, you can answer that question off the top of your head. Oops. Sorry, hi, another a bit slow with the tech. Um, oh, look, I think in terms of that, that's probably a, a really good question that you'd be asking the EDO and with their legal advice um, uh, role on, particularly if there is that opportunity to be asking those types of questions. But yeah, the, the type of liabilities or otherwise in relation to bushfires is um, something that we'd probably advise you to get some um, some advice on. I do, I do tend to think, though, that back to um, Elise's comment that you know, to reiterate what Toby mentioned is that if you do have an agreement that is impacted by fire and um, you're, you are receiving those in perpetuity conservation management payments, then there's opportunities to be working with the BCT around recovery, as Toby mentioned. Um, and there's also, we, we have a five-year review clause in our agreements as well that allows the um, adaptive management over time. So I suppose we take a perspective that we want to be working with landholders to be um, to be improving the, any of the values that have necessarily been impacted by things such as fires and floods. Thanks, Kate, that's really helpful. And yeah, I'll reiterate what Jen said earlier on. Um, if you are after um, legal advice, you can come to EDO at the start and we can either help you ourselves or refer you on to someone who'll be able to help you. Um, I've got a question for John and I know you answered this in the chat, but I thought it might be great to talk about it in case other people had the same question. Um, someone sort of asked about how you get in touch with regional providers and if you provide um, support to maybe local land services or land care. Um, and I just thought if you could share your answer here, that might be helpful for others who had the same question. Yep, sure. Uh, let's hope I give the same answer in verbally that I gave in writing. Eh? <laughs> so, uh, look, uh, yes, look, we work, uh, as I mentioned, in partnership with lots of groups. Um, uh, locally, uh, and our a, a land for wildlife regional provider is typically over a local government area. It can be over several, but it's usually over one. There are a few exceptions to that, and sometimes areas are broken up for for a range of reasons. But usually that lines up with either the land care network or some some other NGO. Um, we don't because the point I'm trying to make here is we don't try and break up in terms of catchments, because we did try that at one stage and nearly went insane trying to, because it turned out not many property owners are sure of just what catchment they're in, but it is actually written on their rate notice who their council is. So once you get that, you've got all the details of the land description, it's, you know, uh, DP numbers and everything and who the council is. And so that makes it much easier for us to, um, you know, get get things together. So we generally try to have them in a local um, a per local government area. If you go onto the CEN website, which is pretty simple, it's www.cen.org.au/slash/land for wildlife/slash. 
or just go onto it and then go to projects and land for wildlife. It'll lead you through. And then there's a whole uh, menu of regional providers. You click on that, up will pop a map that's sort of north of Sydney or south of Sydney. And you can see if your um, local government area is there and, and just click on it and it should give you the details. If, if it turns out they're, they're not there for, because we haven't got one or they're not operating or whatever, then just send us um, an email to uh, LF, uh, Land for Wildlife New South Wales, so lfwnsw at cen.org.au. And that goes to um, myself and volunteers and Rob, and we will respond to you or put you directly in touch with the group if it's um, if there is one, you know. And if you're not in an area that is covered by a regional provider, then then like I say, we we try to collect um, when we've got about five from an area of the state. Um, so Rob can go out and do five at a time rather than if we do one, then travel is so expensive and accommodation, et cetera. So that, yeah, so we do try to provide the service statewide and in the ACT. So yeah, just get in touch with us. We'll do all we can to help you. Phone numbers are there, you know, please um, just send me an email if, um, if we haven't responded. Sometimes the, the uh, system breaks down, but I live in the in the illusion that it all works, but um, <laughs> you never know. Fantastic! Thank you so much for for that, John. It's awesome to hear. Um, yeah, how how across the state you are, how much support there is out there. Um, we have a question about um, how large a pass pass of land needs to be, and again, for that, I might refer you to the guide um, because we sort of go through the criteria for each different type of agreement, and hopefully. From the guide, you can figure out where your land sort of fits in best. Um, I might sort of give that the same answer for the most recent question in the chat. Someone's asked, um, do any of these arrangements support reintroduction of a particular species better than others? Um, unless anyone on the panel has a particular answer to that, I think, again, maybe refer to the guide. We sort of give a bit of an assessment of um, how effective different agreements can be with defending the unburnt. Um, so hopefully that can be a helpful starting point for you there. Um, BCT, you've got a koala strategy. Yeah, we, we do. I mean, we, we get that question a lot from landholders wanting to reintroduce species onto their, their property. Um, and I, I guess our response to that, it, it's not something that the BCT has has a program to do. Um, we had a lot of um, misunderstanding with a koala program that we ran a few years ago where people were wondering when we were going to deliver koalas to their property and that's that's not what we do. We, we protect the land and the habitat that is there and exists and I think translocation of species is a really um, it's something that takes a lot of work, a lot of effort and a lot of research to achieve. And the you know, Department of DPE, Planning and Environment, um, their SOS and Threatened Species Program, you know, in some instances may do that kind of work, but it's not something that you can just pick up a species from one location and release it to another location. So it's not, it's not something that's part of our program per se. I'm not aware of it being part of any of the others either. It's more protecting what's there already as opposed to bringing um, species in um, from elsewhere. But correct me if I'm wrong, yep. panelists. Well, yeah, in, in, in answer to that question, like in the case of fauna, it's true. Our programs do support revegetation and um, replanting areas or supplementary planting of different species but not for fauna. It might be a case of build it and they will come. <laughs> well, I think I might leave the questions there for tonight because I think we've, yeah, we've done a pretty good job of answering what's come through the Q&A in the chat. Um, so thank you panelists so much for your time tonight. We really appreciate your expertise. It's 
you know, one thing to read it in the guide, but it's fantastic to have you all speaking to your experience with it and, yeah, sharing all the fantastic work that your organisations do. Um, and, of course, thank you to everyone joining on the line. It's just great for us to see how much interest there is in private conservation. It gives me a lot of hope for, yeah, defending these unburnt areas across New South Wales. Um, as I said, we'll do um, a webinar on Queensland and Victoria later in the year. So if you know people in those states, um, please spread the word. Um, any final words, Jam or panelists? No? All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining. And yeah, any questions, reach out to us. Um, but otherwise, enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.